Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 25 I Strike the Jolly Roger I had scarce gained a position on the bowsprit, when the flying jib flapped and filled upon the other tack with a report like a gun. The schooner trembled to her keel under the reverse, but next moment, the other sails still drawing, the jib flapped back again and hung idle. This had nearly tossed me off into the sea, and now I lost no time, crawled back along the bowsprit, and tumbled head foremost on the deck. I was on the lee side of the forecastle, and the mainsail, which was still drawing, concealed from me a certain portion of the after-deck. Not a soul was to be seen. The planks, which had not been swabbed since the mutiny, bore the print of many feet, and an empty bottle, broken by the neck, tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scuppers. Suddenly the Hispaniola came right into the wind. The jibs behind me cracked aloud, the rudder slammed too, the whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder, and at the same moment the main boom swung inboard, the sheet groaning in the blocks, and showed me the lee after deck. There were the two watchmen, sure enough, red cap on his back, as stiff as a handspike, with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix and his teeth showing through his open lips. Israel hands propped against the bulwarks, his chin on his chest, his hands lying open before him on the deck, his face as white under its tan as a tallow candle. For a while the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse, the sails filling, now on one tack, now on another, and the boom swinging to and fro till the mass groaned aloud under the strain. Now and again, too, there would come a cloud of light sprays over the bulwark, and a heavy blow of the ship's bows against the swell. So much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my home-made lopsided coracle, now gone to the bottom of the sea. At every jump of the schooner, Red Cap slipped to and fro, but what was ghastly to behold, neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth disclosing grin was any way disturbed by this rough usage. At every jump, too, hands appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck, his feet sliding ever the farther out, and the whole body canting towards the stern, so that his face became, little by little, hid from me, and at last I could see nothing beyond his ear and the frayed ringlet of one whisker. At the same time I observed, around both of them, splashes of dark blood upon the planks, and began to feel sure that they had killed each other in their drunken wrath. While I was thus looking and wondering in a calm moment, when the ship was still, Israel hands turned partly round, and with a low moan, writhed himself back to the position in which I had seen him first. The moan, which told of pain and deadly weakness, and the way in which his jaw hung open, went right to my heart. But when I remembered the talk I had overheard from the apple-barrel, all pity left me. I walked aft until I reached the mainmast. "'Come aboard, Mr. Hands.' I said ironically. He rolled his eyes round heavily, but he was too far gone to express surprise. All he could do was to utter one word. Brandy! It occurred to me there was no time to lose, and dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck, I slipped aft and down the companion stairs into the cabin. It was such a scene of confusion as you can hardly fancy. All the lock-fast places had been broken open in the quest of the chart. The floor was thick with mud, where ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp. The bulkheads, 
all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt, bore a pattern of dirty hands. Dozens of empty bottles clinked together in corners to the rolling of the ship. One of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table, half of the leaves gutted out, I suppose, for pipe lights. In the midst of all this the lamp still cast a smoky glow, obscure and brown as umber. I went into the cellar. All the barrels were gone, and of the bottles a most surprising number had been drunk out and thrown away. Certainly, since the mutiny began, not a man of them could ever have been sober. Foraging about, I found a bottle with some brandy left, for hands, and for myself I routed out some biscuit, some pickled fruits, a great bunch of raisins, and a piece of cheese. With these I came on deck, put down my own stock behind the rudder-head, and well out of the coxswain's reach, went forward to the water-breaker, and had a good deep drink of water, and then, and not till then, gave hands the brandy. He must have drunk a gill before he took the bottle from his mouth. "'Aye,' said he, "'by thunder, but I wanted some of that.' I had sat down already in my own corner and begun to eat. "'Much hurt?' I asked him. He grunted, or rather I might say he barked. "'If that doctor was aboard,' he said, "'I'd be right enough on a couple of turns. "'But I don't have no manner of luck, you see, "'and that's what's the matter with me. "'As for that swab, he's good and dead he is,' "'he added, indicating the man with the red cap. "'He weren't no seaman anyhow.' "'And where might you have come from?' "'Well,' said I, "'I've come aboard to take possession of this ship, Mr. Hands, "'and you'll please regard me as your captain until further notice.' "'He looked at me sourly enough, but said nothing. "'Some of the colour had come back into his cheeks, "'though he still looked very sick, "'and still continued to slip out and settle down as the ship banged about. "'By the by,' I continued, I can't have these colors, Mr. Hands, and by your leave I'll strike em. Better none than these. And again dodging the boom, I ran to the color lines, handed down the cursed black flag, and chucked it overboard. God save the king, said I, waving my cap, and there's an end to Captain Silver. He watched me keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. I reckon he said at last. I reckon, Cap'n Hawkins, you'll kind of want to get ashore now. Suppose we talks. Why, yes, says I, with all my heart, Mr. Hands, say on, and I went back to my meal with a good appetite. This man, he began, nodding feebly at the corpse. O'Brien were his name, a rank, Irelander. This man and me got the canvas on her, meaning for to sail her back. Well, he's dead now, he is, as dead as bilge, and who's to sail this ship I don't see. Without I gives you a hint, you ain't that man as far as I can tell. Now look here, you gives me food and drink in an old scarf or ankature to tie my wound up, you do. And I'll tell you how to sail her, and that's about square all round, I take it. I'll tell you one thing, says I. I'm not going back to Captain Kidd's anchorage. I mean to get into North Inlet and beach her quietly there. To be sure you did, he cried. Why, I ain't sich an infernal lubber after all. I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling, I have, and I've lost, and it's you has the wind of me. North Inlet, why, I haven't no choice, not I. I'd help you sail her up to execution dock by thunder, so I would. Well, as it seemed to me, there was some sense in this. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island 
with good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon, and beating down again as far as North Inlet before high water, when we might beach her safely, and wait till the subsiding tide permitted us to land. Then I lashed the tiller, and went below to my own chest, where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. With this, and with my aid, hands bound up the great bleeding stab he had received in the thigh. And after he had eaten a little, and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, he began to pick up visibly, sat straighter up, spoke louder and clearer, and looked in every way another man. The breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, the coast of the island flashing by and the view changing every minute. Soon we were past the highlands and bowling beside low, sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines. And soon we were beyond that again, and had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was greatly elated with my new command, and pleased with the bright sunshiny weather and these different prospects of the coast. I had now plenty of water and good things to eat and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I had made. I should, I think, have had nothing left me to desire but for the eyes of the coxswain as they followed me derisively about the deck, and the odd smile that appeared continually on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness a haggard old man's smile. But there was, besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery, in his expression as he craftily watched, and watched, and watched me at my work. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Israel Hands The Wind serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much the easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only, as we had no power to anchor, and dared not beach her till the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Captain said he, at length, with that same uncomfortable smile. "'Here's my old shipmate, O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular, as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash. But I don't reckon him ornamental now, do you?' "'I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job, and there he lies for me,' said I. This here's an unlucky ship, this Hispaniola, Jim, he went on blinking. There's a power of men been killed in this Hispaniola. A sight, a poor seaman dead and gone since you and me took ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this here O'Brien now. He's dead, ain't he? Well, now, I'm no scholar and your lad as can read and figure, and to put it straight, do you take it as dead man is dead for good, or do he come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hands, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world and may be watching us. Ah, says he, well, that's unfortunate. Appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsomever, spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now, you've spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a, well, a, shiver me timbers. I can't hit the name on't. Well, you get me a bottle of wine, Jim. This here brandy's too strong for my head. 
Now the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural, and as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So much was plain. But with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay, and that, with a fellow so densely stupid, I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. "'Some wine,' I said. "'Far better. Will you have white or red?' "'Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate.' he replied. So it's strong, and plenty of it. What's the odds? All right, I answered. I'll bring you port, Mr. Hands, but I'll have to dig for it. With that I scuttled down the companion, with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the sparred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out of the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was at a good rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers and picked out of a coil of rope, a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discolored to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his underjaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then, hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about, he was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What he would do afterwards, whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might come first to help him, was of course more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point. Since in that our interests jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner, we both desired to have her stranded safe enough, in a sheltered place, and so that when the time came she could be got off again with as little labor and danger as might be. And until that was done I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body, I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine, and now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle, and with his eyelids lowered as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig, with his unfortunate toast of, Here's luck. Then he lay quiet for a little, and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. Cut me a chunk of that, says he, for I haven't no knife, and hardly strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, uh, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed stays. Cut me a quid, as'll likely be the last, lad, for I'm for my long home, and no mistake. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you, and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers, like a Christian man. Why, said he, 
Now you tell me why. Why? I cried. You are asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this moment. And you ask me why? For God's mercy, Mr. Hands, that's why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket and designed, in his ill thoughts, to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For thirty years, he said, I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives going, and what not. Well, now I tell you, I never seen good come a goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. That's my views. Amen, so be it. And now you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. We've had a, about enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good, prompt subaltern, and I am very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about and dodged in, shaving the banks with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage. But the space was longer and narrower, and more like, what in truth it was, the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed, and on the deck of it shore bushes had taken root, and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now, said Hans, look there. There's a pet bit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw. Trees all around of it, and flowers a-blowin' like a guarding on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how shall we get her off again? Why so, he replied. You take a line ashore, there on the other side at low water. Take a turn about one of them big pines. Bring it back. Take a turn around the capstan. And lie to for the tide. Come high water. All hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes, as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We're near the bit now. She's too much way on her. Starboard a little. So, steady. Starboard. Larboard a little. Steady. Steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed. Till, all of a sudden, he cried, Now, my hearty, luff! And I put the helm hard up and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last manoeuvres had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto, sharply enough upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head, and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks, and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life, had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak, or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct, 
like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked round, there was Hans, already halfway towards me, with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bully's. At the same instant he threw himself forward, and I leapt sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him for a moment dead. Before he could recover, I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell. But there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with seawater. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had not I long before reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move. His grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly. I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed into the bows, as a moment since he had so nearly boxed me in the stern. Once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, which was of a goodish bigness, and waited, each nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part, and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope of any ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, Suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, canted over to the port side till the deck stood at an angle of forty-five degrees, and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper holes and lay in a pool between the deck and bulwark. We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers. The dead red cap, with his arms still spread out, tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we, indeed, that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had to find some new way of escape, and that upon the instant for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross-trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight, and there stood Israel Hands, with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol, and then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. 
he began to see the dice going against him, and after an obvious hesitation he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and with the dirk in his teeth began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. "'One more step, Mr. Hands,' said I, "'and I'll blow your brains out. "'Dead men don't bite, you know,' I added with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that in my newfound security I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but in all else he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you but for that there lurch, but I don't have no luck, not I, and I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yunker like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a wall, when all in a breath back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang, and there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I am sure it was without a conscious aim. Both my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosed his grip upon the shrouds and plunged head first into the water. End of chapter 26 Recorded December 5th, 2005